Hi, this is David A. Ben, founder of The Bucket and host of today's podcast. You know, one of the ongoing challenges we face uh, every day is getting past this taboo of death to get people to have conversations about their mortality without putting their hands over their ears and closing their eyes. We think the conversations will lead to happier, more fulfilling lives. And two people who have embraced that thinking are Laurie Lo Cicero and Lisa Paul. They've actually created a party game called The Death Deck that gets people talking and thinking about their own mortality in a fun, refreshing way. Laurie is a director, producer, and author of a recent book entitled Clouds Far Behind Me, a memoir recounting her own personal loss. Lisa is a hospice social worker and ER crisis interventionist who has a passionate belief that peace at the end begins with meaningful conversations over time. Welcome, Laurie and Lisa. Thanks for talking with me. Thank you, David. Thank you for having me. And for our, for our <laughs> listeners, Laurie, you say hello so everyone can hear your voice. Hello. And Lisa, you say hello. Hi, David. Hello. Uh, I'm going to give uh, each of you a chance to give a little bit more background on yourselves. Uh, but I think the first thing I want to do is get right into this about uh, what the death deck is. And if you're listening, it might help to, if you've got your computer in front of you, to go to thedeathdeck.com because seeing it can really help you understand what it's all about. And so uh, I found out what it was about uh, by being on Twitter. Um, I recall seeing it. I forget how, whether you followed me or I followed you. We, we saw that we had some connection there, but it was kind of wild, like this, this game, this party game about death. And so why don't we start with you, Laurie, talking about what is the game and what's it all about? Yes, thank you. So the Death Deck is a party game. It's also a great conversation tool. And basically what we have created is hopefully the conversation starter for people who, you know, do not want to talk about this subject, uh, push it away. I don't want, I don't want to deal with it, but this is the way to sort of just open those general conversations and then hopefully lead people to then have further deeper conversations. So we added some humorous elements to it. We made it a both a multiple choice and interactive game so that it would have people not feel on the spot. Because we found with a lot of the conversation cards that, that are in the subject matter, um, being put on the spot is not always easy and very emotional. So we've tried to come at it at a little different angle to where we are having people interact and ask each other and try to guess each other's answers. But it really gets you thinking about some of these things around death and dying, uh, your final wishes, documents you may or may not have, your beliefs in the afterlife. And what we've found is that, you know, as, as many people, you know, say, oh, no, I don't want to talk about that. You know, once we can get them to start talking about it, they really do want to talk about it because generally they just will keep talking about it and not be quiet about it. So, yeah, the Conversation Project is, a, is an organization that I, I think a lot of people are aware of that tries to have people get them to have these conversations about death. But your tact is to kind of bring some humor into it and make it fun. Uh, can you give some examples of some of the, the cards that you have? Sure. So, you know, one of the ones which is um, actually not a multiple choice, but uh, is is called On the Rack. And it's an open-ended question. And it is, if your spouse died, which article of his or her clothing would you want to keep? And which one would you be glad never to see again? <laughs> so it gets, you know, couples talking about, you know, those items. But also, you know, I experienced a, a lot the loss of my husband. And one of the things that was extremely difficult for me was parting with his things. And I think um, just knowing possibly that, you know, he, he, we never had that conversation. So knowing that like, you know, please just get rid of stuff. You don't need things. Because I was hanging on in the beginning to even like post-it notes that had his handwriting on it. It's just the things that I just like, I can't get rid of anything. But, you know, really it's those couple of elements or couple of things that really spark those wonderful memories is eventually what I was able to hang on to and want to keep. Well, uh, Lisa. well what I love about that question, Lori, is that when we've played that in, in a game setting, it, it does, it, it broaches the topic of thinking about 
the loss of your spouse and, and kind of creating um, conversations about that. But at the same time, people can balance that out with joking around about that old college sweatshirt that has a thousand holes in it that they really can't bear to see their husband in one more time. Um, and so I think that that card is a great example of how we're trying to um, ask thoughtful questions um, but yet continue to, to keep it a little lighter and with a little more humor um, to, to make it um, more, more fun. Yeah, talk about when I'm sure you've watched people play the game. Actually, let me, let me take a step back because you know something I've gone through is people look at you like you're crazy, first of all, that you're talking about death, and why would I ever want to talk about that? So what what do you say when people look at you like you're crazy? <laughs> well, they do all the time, um, <laughs> especially when they hear the name of the game, the death deck. Um, sometimes we'll get a scrunched up face and why would you call it that? And um, But, you know, we call it that because that's what it is. We're trying to start these conversations about um, about end of life and death. And we don't think that people need to be afraid to say the word death. Um, and so I, I usually tell people a little bit about my work and why I, why this is important to me. Um, when I, when they give me that look, I say, Oh, I get it. You know, All right, that's however, a, we're, that's a good segue. Working into, in hospice, yeah. yeah. T- talk about what you do. So, um, I work as a licensed clinical social worker and for about 12 years I've worked in hospice um, and I've worked for about six years in the emergency department. And so in both settings, um, I encounter people every day that have never really had any conversations with their loved ones about what they would want at end of life or if they have this severe health crisis, like a stroke, um, they've never talked about. I feel like the conversations surrounding um, these decisions are the most important part. The advanced directive is also incredibly important, and I shouldn't say conversations are more important. They go together. But, um, but even if you do an advanced directive, those are just words on a page um, and open to quite a bit of interpretation. And so in my experience, people... I've had the most confidence in making decisions for their loved ones when they've actually had a conversation about it. And no. they can say, remember, we talked about this with dad. Um, so that's, that's what we're trying to create. Have you had any experiences, either of you, uh, where people have uh, come back to you after they've heard of the game and uh, told you a story about how, it, it, how playing the game helped them with their conversations? Well, actually, I... Um, one that I really enjoy um, was a, a younger couple that um, I started playing the game with them in a in a bar setting. Just brought the deck out and invited anybody who wanted to come over and play. And um, they reached out to me uh, the next day and said that through that through our game, um, they had finally come to a decision on which who was going to get their child in their will, basically who they were going to give custody to or grant guardianship to. And which was the piece that they kept putting off doing their will because they couldn't figure out, you know, who, whose family that um, was going to be the guardian of their child. So that was incredibly rewarding. Um, and that's exactly what we're trying to do. Yeah. D- d- if you've watched people play the game, do you see the barriers break down? Like first it's like, kind of, I don't want to be talking about this, and then suddenly they get into it and and start playing? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that we enjoy watching with playing the game, because it it is set up like a game, you can set a time limit or a point limit, because you do get points if you guess your partner's answer correctly. But what we've found is a lot of times, uh, we start as a competitive game and people have their score sheets, and what happens is, is that we get two or three questions in, and the scoring sort of goes out the window, which is fine because people start to engage not only with the partner that they're playing with, but with everyone else around the table. And so it becomes just this sort of 
conversation back and forth and people's ideas. And it's just really a beautiful thing to watch. And so these people that are at first saying, oh, yeah, no, I'm not. I'm not really into it, but I'll play it. But then all of a sudden, you know, everyone is talking about these very important issues and laughing and having a good time and and sort of uh, having in their mind, okay, you know, this is something that we probably really should do. And that's what we're, you know, we, we want to spark that. That's the spark we want to get is for people to then, you know, that call to action to, to actually go home and further these conversations. Yeah, I um, recently, my wife looked at me and said, I know where I want my ashes to go. And wow. he finally was able to do that and tell me the place. And it was uh, a conversation that we had that went beyond that at the time. And it was it's it's rewarding to get there. And what's amazing to me is how almost everything that I've seen on the cards, the answers will surprise the person they're closest with. Do you find mm-hmm. that? Absolutely. We it's actually been pretty fun to listen to um, not just couples, but we've, um, we've had friends partner up and, um, you know, a son and his dad. And what I've enjoyed is listening to how someone else perceives what you think about end of life questions is, is really fascinating. And watching couples or family members and friends kind of, I wouldn't say argue with each other, but you know, really, I, you would not do that. Really? You know, <laughs> just be surprised by these answers. And, um, and we end up not usually getting through very many questions, which, um, you know, Lori and I were pretty surprised at when we, when we developed the game, we thought, oh, we need so many questions. We want to make sure people can play it multiple times. And, and what we're finding is people typically get through about 10 questions, maybe, mm-hmm. um, and because there's just so much conversation that then occurs. Um, and one last thing that I really enjoyed and, you know, working in social work and trying to bring people together um, is that these conversations aren't just about preparing um, for end of life and, and living well. They're also about connections with each other. Um, and when you have, conversations that are so that are about important meaningful things not just the weather your day politics but about big things um you end up feeling a lot closer to the yeah. people that you're with yeah that showing that vulnerability uh can really bring people closer and you know that's one of the things um uh, with our goal at the bucket is to not it's not about making the end better necessarily it's about making the time you have left better and by talking about this and by thinking ahead um you could do that so it sounds like you're saying that you know this isn't just about death it's about life oh most definitely yeah i mean by talking about it by taking the the fear out of it by you know embracing the fact that we are here for a limited time and that's what we love i would love about the bucket is you know it's just is having sort of a number and a a deadline essentially to sort of look at your life and say okay where am i now and if i've got this much more time left you know what do i really want to do with this and when you don't have you know sort of that end date or that number or something, you know, that non-embracing of the fact that, you know, we're here for a limited amount of time. I think sometimes things get pushed off and till the very end, like we do on work deadlines. It's like, you know, and we don't want, who wants to wait until the very end and then realize, gosh, I really should have, you know, I should have been living then. I mean, that's, those were the years I, I wanted to get these things done. So I think it's a great incentive and push and reminder that, you know, here we are, we have, we have these days, let's live them. Yeah. Uh, so I have a question for each of you. Um, Laurie, what is your bucket age? My bucket age is 31. Okay. And Lisa, your bucket age? 42. Yeah. The bucket age is something that, um, we get a lot of feedback on as and a lot of people when they come to our site, calculate their bucket age. And, uh, sometimes we get people pushing back and saying, you know, you don't know when you're going to die and and, and, and you, how can you tell somebody that and you need to live for the moment and not worry about when you're going to die. And, and it's, it's a funny 
you get funny reactions, but it all seems to be tied, the negative reactions to be tied to that taboo of death and we don't want to talk about it. And, uh, you know, I call that uh, the choir. Like we are, we are in the choir in that uh, we believe in this stuff and we believe in the, in the positivity that can come out of it and that it can help you make decisions that can help you have a more fulfilling life. How do you think, first of all, let me ask you, uh, Lisa, do you think there is a choir? Yeah, but I'm happy to say I think the choir is growing. Um, it's certainly growing. There's more and more people that are um, kind of coming into the death and dying space. Um, and I think uh, it's becoming a little a little less taboo um, to have some of these conversations. And however, um, it, it's, it's kind of slow going. You know, I have been interested to hear people's responses when I tell people that I work in hospice. And then when I say I developed a game to get people talking about death, like you put those together and they look at me like I just, must be this dark, <laughs> morbid person. <laughs> but there's certainly the people outside the choir. We're we're still working on engaging those people and finding different ways to to bring them around. Yeah, Laurie, do you, do you feel the same way? Yeah, and I mean that's what this game is all about. I mean, we're trying to reach people not in the moment. We're trying to reach people that haven't just been given a terminal diagnosis. We're trying to get people to talk about this when that pressure isn't there so that it becomes more of an engaging conversation. Um, and it's a fascinating conversation to have about life, death, afterlife, you know, what people's views are. So if we can get people talking about it when it's not something that is present in their life and in that emotional space, we find that it's just a, a, such a great way to reach people who are not then thrust into this immediacy of, oh my God, we have to figure this out. So we're hoping to, right. <laughs> to break out of that choir and, and get everyone involved. So um, we know that it's a tough nut to crack, but we are, the, our mission is to, you know, to get people talking and playing and embracing and uh, having these conversations early. Yeah. And, and your story, you were forced into it, right? I was, yeah. I unfortunately had to have a excruciating conversation with my husband um, when he was um, he had been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, and he didn't want to talk about these things. I mean, we thought we we thought we had prepared, but we had you know we had wills and we had advanced directives, but we we didn't have the deeper conversations and the detailed conversations. So when it got to the point in his illness where it was eminent that he was going to die, I felt the need to have this conversation with him in the moment. And it was something that, you know, was really the spark of this game. It's like, you, I don't want anyone to ever have to be in that moment and have to have this conversation. It is not the time to have it. So from that and from my grieving process and from realizing, you know, working with Lisa and, deal and dealing with, you know, that this is such an issue that, you know, that why are we not having these conversations? And we just didn't know of some of the details to have of the conversation. So, you know, it, it's just, it's so important. Yeah. And how did you two come together to create this game? Well, um, as Lori mentioned, her husband, Joe, um, died of pancreatic cancer, and that was uh, 10 years ago. And um, Lori and I met because I was the hospice social worker that was assigned to Joe and his family. Um, and so I provided bereavement support for Lori afterwards, and we had many, many conversations in her backyard about grief and how her two young children um, were doing and whether they should come to the celebration of life and how they should be involved. And um, so it started as a uh, professional relationship. However, we certainly had 
quite fondness for each other. And I was, I, I mean, from meeting, I meet all sorts of people and all sorts of families. And there was something that I really connected with, with Lori. Um, so after um, providing bereavement support to Lori for a little longer than typical, <laughs> um, because I really liked her, um, we, we kind of uh, parted ways for a couple of years. And then several years later, we started talking about this need and what can we do? And we kind of we decided on, um, you know, how can we keep people from being in the situation that Lori was in with Joe? And, um, and that's the idea of how the death deck was born. And it took a lot of back and forth and writing. Um, I think, you know, I provided a lot of the <clears throat> content for, um, what's important that people talk about. Um, and Lori is one of the funniest people I've ever met. So she, <laughs> and a little bit oh, with my on. husband, um, <laughs> added the humor. <laughs> you, Lori and my husband, Clay, who, you know, I should need to acknowledge that he helped us uh, insert some humor in some of those as well. Um, yes. So, which, which the humor piece was both, was really important for both of us. Because, um, I mean, to me, that's how I cope with life. That's how my family's always coped. That's how I, I believe that you can find humor in even the darkest of situations. So, like, have you when you've watched people play the game? Like, is there some? Is there a, a card or a question that really gets people laughing and uh, really kind of letting their guard down? Yeah. So I have a multiple choice one here, and it's. Um, would you consider a biodegradable burial pod that uses your remains to grow a tree? And A, totally, if the tree bears fruit, you can enjoy me in a whole new way. B, undecided, maybe plant a tree in my honor instead. Or C, nope, not my idea of returning to my roots. <laughs> there we go. That's a good one. <laughs> But, you know, that's a heavy they're, topic, they're you know, like these chocolate. burial pods. So, but, you know, you start to think about it and, and, you know, you laugh and then you go, well, okay, well, maybe, I don't know. You know so, well, In some ways, this, this game gives uh, permission to ask these questions at, kind of like this. I don't want to know the answer to this question, but I have to ask this question because I picked up this card. And it kind of just pushes people that way without them being responsible for asking their spouse uh, a difficult question. Exactly. Yeah. And what we found, too, is that, you know, a lot there are a lot of conversation cards out there to start these topics, to start these conversations. Um, all the ones that we found are the open ended questions. So you're kind of, again, put on the spot to come up with your own answer rather than having sort of a multiple choice answer to sort of align yourself with. Um, we like that too, because if you haven't really thought about it, you don't really know it, Now you're given sort of a scale of, mm, I, I would align myself with probably that answer. So it helps to get people to sort of, you know, embrace that and start to think about what that answer might be. I do enjoy, um, when people, you know, some people really hate to be, put in a box or forced to make a decision. And so they'll, um, we have A, B, and C answers on the multiple choice ones. And, and regularly people will say D and they'll come up with their answer and they'll, um, <laughs> which, um, which is totally fine because all we're getting, trying to get them to do is to talk about this. But, exactly. um, but yeah, sometimes, sometimes like the pushback that you might see with the bucket age is kind of like um, people want to, they want an answer that's not there, and it's um, which honestly was a very challenging piece of writing um, the questions is is that we're then trying to predict um, or make some good guesses on what people's responses might be, um, and then make those responses kind of funny. So, um, and I think that's where we insert a lot of the humor. Isn't necessarily the question itself, like this one is after you die, how long should your significant other wait before dating? Which, by the way, this is a lively conversation. Um, 
So A, love is unpredictable. Grab it when you can. B is six months to a year, and then it's fair game. And C, at least a few years, or you better believe you'll be haunted. Um, <laughs> so again, people just kind of chuckle a little bit, and then it, it lightens it up to say what your answer is. Um, but well, that one usually sparks some interesting um, Yeah, and those are questions that that people aren't asking on their own, and it's just too awkward. And the game gets those questions asked. I have to admit, when I first saw the death deck and I said like oh wow I wonder how they did this and like I'm, like even in in the choir I'm thinking oh boy and then I <laughs> I started I started reading them and I was like wow this this really is you know taking um something that other organizations are trying to do but really doing it understanding human nature and how people are so resistant to it and how you get them to talk about it. Well, thank you. That's, that's what we're trying to do. And again, I think, um, you know, that the death deck comes with 112 questions. And so um, most of them are multiple choice, but we do have 30 or so open-ended questions um, as well to kind of start those conversations. Um, but, we designed the game so that some of the questions are, um, you know, lighter than other questions. And so we, we encourage people to, to, to know your audience. You know, we want people to be able to use this um, game for game night with family and friends. And I would say most of the, all the cards are fair game in that setting. But then I've used it with my hospice team. Um, starting our we have weekly meetings and and with those I um you know I'm choosing questions that I want that I think will be helpful for people to be thinking about so again we're we try to create a wide variety of topics yeah it sounds like you come at it from different angles and different intensities and kind of allow people to go at their own pace if you will right and if you're the one bringing the game um, then you get to kind of, you know, stack the deck and put the <laughs> cards. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Take the cards out that you don't want asked and put the cards in that you want to know. I, I mean, that's what I've done with my family. I, I've uh, brought them together and said, "Here we go. Um, this is what I want to know, Mom and Dad." Um, which actually was a really fun. I've now played with them several times, and I. Uh, I keep being surprised at um, even being in the choir and creating this game. Uh, there's still things that I, I don't know I about think, my parents and what they want. I think that is the most compelling reason to get this game is because of the, I didn't know that response that it seems to, seems to happen with almost every question and how, are we living without knowing these important answers? You know, that that's what this game helps with. Yeah. And it's so much easier, I think, to approach, you know, a parent or a spouse with, you know, a silly card game um, that has humor in it rather than sitting down and saying, you know, we really should have this important conversation. And I think that, you know, by having sort of this tool or device something you can, you know, almost blame it on, like, oh, well, we should right. try to play this game, you know, these are some funny cards, is a lot easier to just sort of just start to open that conversation. Absolutely. So how can people get this game? They can get it on our website, which is thedeathdeck.com. Uh, we also sell on Amazon, and we're on all the social media channels as The Death Deck. Well, uh, Laurie and Lisa, thank you so much for talking with me today and uh, I hope everyone goes out and gets the death deck. Thank you so much. Thank Thanks you. for having us, David. Thank you. So is there anything that I missed that you would like to say about the death deck? Um, we covered so Lori, much. Yeah. We... No, I know I you're quick. Right. You're I was going to say, is, is there anything that you want us to cover with the bucket? Uh, or anything that we want to, well, I guess, yeah. I guess, uh, I'd love to know what you think of the bucket. Well, well, I was just going to say, I what I've really enjoyed about the bucket is the wide range of um, interviews and people 
that you're speaking with. And I'm impressed at how many people seem um, open and on board and willing to, to talk with you guys. It seems like, um, I mean, has that been your response that you've found people are, are pretty um, agreeable, everybody that you're reaching out to? Um, yes, for the most part. Um, you know, one of the things um, about the choir and about the bucket is that what we're trying to do is deliver mainstream content that just happens uh-huh. to be about this. So that, um, you know, we're, we could say we're not about um, dying, we're about living, we're not about death, we're about life. Um, and so what we try to do is, as in our recent uh, theme, Dog's Life, it's all about dogs, but it's how mm-hmm. death and and dealing with the death of animals and your own perspective on life through dogs. And anybody would read that article. It's not about people looking for articles on the topic. These aren't the people who just searched on Google for the Death Cafe and now they're mm-hmm. coming to the bucket. So what we're trying to do from a editorial standpoint is have mainstream articles that go into these areas of talking about death and mortality and really for this audience which is you know basically young boomers um, who still have plenty of bucket years left uh, how are you going to live those lives live those years and uh, and not have this be something that uh, sneaks up on you and now we're assuming, for the most part, that we're talking about um, uh, a natural lifespan. Um, certainly what you were talking about, what you've dealt with, uh, Laurie, personally, and Lisa, what you deal with every day, you know, these are sad things. We're not trying to say that they aren't. Um, but what we're trying to do with a bucket is say, uh, you know, we don't want you to get to the end of your life regretting something that you didn't do um, because you didn't know how um, or didn't think that didn't plan for it. And so that's mm-hmm. one of the things we're, we're trying to accomplish with the buckets uh, editorial. And uh, that's how we approach people when we're trying to get interviews uh, that we're, you know, really talking about life, not death. Yeah. And I so appreciate that because yeah, you said I we I was not anticipating the loss of my husband in our early forties. I mean, that was just not that was not going to happen. But it but it did, and it does. And I now so embrace you know websites like the Bucket that you know that really do talk about you know embracing that mortality, uh, looking at that age, even though we just don't know. But you know, it it helps to you know, guide your life. And I, I really do mm-hmm. truly believe that, you know, that if you are able to sort of just look at that number and just see that it's like, okay, yeah, I mean, I, I acknowledge that. And now, you know, just to, to live fully and knowing that, you know, once you can accept it, you can, you can really live fully. I'm not explaining myself well. No, no, it, really that, it, 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 no you did. <laughs> it makes, it makes <laughs> a lot of sense. Um, but I mean, I know from my personal experience, you know, I so embrace life now. I mean, now I know that it can happen at any time. Um, I don't want it to happen, you know, anytime soon. But, you know, and, and, and Lisa laughs at this because I always say, you know, my, my goal is 100. And, you know, that's what I'm looking <laughs> that's for. That's not my goal. <laughs> <laughs> Lisa's goal is not 100, but I'm I'm living to 100. But you know, I know that you know from my experience that it you know every day you know you just don't know what will happen tomorrow. And so you know, I am trying to live and embrace you know every moment, every day, do what I can while I still can do it, and not get to you know whether it's that you know in 31 years of my bucket age or 100, and look back and go why did you wait until your eighties to do what you really wanted to do? Like do it now, you know, go for it now. And um, another thing I really love about what y'all are doing is, you know, it's, it is similar to what we're trying to do is like it, if you, if you're not in the moment of, you know, 
having someone with a terminal illness or ha having someone in hospice and you can talk about these things just as a general conversation. I mean, I think there's just, there's such an emotional weight to talking about death and dying. And when you can release that, you know, that, that fear and that emotional attachment to it and just talk about it as a subject, it's fascinating. I, I think it really is fascinating. Like what you talked about with, you know, talking about dogs and pet loss and whatnot and the human nature of it. And it, it just, it, it's so refreshing to be able to have these conversations and talk about these things without cringing up and going, Oh, but, uh, and bringing in it in all the emotions, because that's what I believe life is all about. Yeah. It's, it certainly is. You know, one of the things we, we talk about, um, with the bucket is that we're trying to rebrand death, that it has the mm -hmm. worst brand in the world. And, <laughs> it does. And, uh, yet there's to your point, Talking about it can bring benefits. And, yes. And so you can choose to not talk about it because it's morbid and, you know, that just you don't want to be depressed. Or you can choose to talk about it and then suddenly uh, you might say, I'm going to change what I'm doing. I'm going to make a choice to move to France for a year or something like that. But when you allow yourself to think about how many years you have left, um, it might be that catalyst that gets you off your ass to do it. Exactly. Yeah. I think you guys are doing amazing things. And if we can get the mainstream uh, to be a little more habituated and, and that death conversations are kind of normal and just included and people are more exposed to that, then, then perhaps we can, you know, reach the, the people outside the choir. So what do you think? I mean, if you're still listening, you're either part of the choir or someone who can help us reach outside the choir and spread the word about how acknowledging your own mortality can not only help you lead a more fulfilling life, but also help you die with fewer regrets. For more information about The Death Deck, go to thedeathdeck.com. And for more information about The Bucket, go to thebucket.com. That's thebucket, all one word, dot com.